because uh, I, in all perfect honesty, thought we had another week. <laughs> so I was like, oh yeah, life is good, we're in week 11, we'll do it again next week, we'll, we'll, we'll polish it off. And then somebody in astronomy was like, oh, is there an exam today? I'm like, no, what, what, like, we're, we're in week 11, like, or week 11, week 12, I, I don't know, like, I don't, I've lost track. So I honestly thought that we had, what, two weeks and then finals? And I completely biffed it. So what do you guys want to do? And, and I don't know, I mean, like, so here's, here's the thing I'm thinking of is, uh, I mean, I could drop an exam, Today, I mean, like I could, I could post an exam. I don't know if it would be the best one, and I feel bad because I didn't give you any forewarning because I thought that we had an extra week, so I assume that you thought we had an extra week, and so, so, so that's part of it. Um, but the, then the next one is I'm not really keen on having it ready for next week unless you guys all tell me it's okay because next week is technically dead week and. I, although I don't agree with the philosophy of not having exams on dead week, I agree with the philosophy of I shouldn't spring an exam on you during dead week. Like, I'm okay with giving you an exam during dead week, but I have to tell you well in advance that it's going to happen, which can't happen at this point, right? It's not like I can. So I'm not very keen on giving it to you next week because it's unannounced and it's a particularly busy time during the term. So because of my haphazardness and not paying attention, that means that, okay, so that means, so, you know, either, here's what I've managed to come up with in the five minutes of reflection. Yeah. It seems that, okay, the exam's gonna be on finals week. And so that, that's, that's the first piece. And so the question is, first of all, do we only do one exam during finals week? And then I have to figure out what happens to the extra 15 points. Right? Because I think exams are something like there's like each exam is 30 points and the final is like 15 or something. So each exam is 10 points and then the final is 15 points. So one way is okay, you just drop one of the exams and I got to figure out how to redistribute that 15 points. Right. That's option one. Uh, and bear in mind that then that third exam would cover basically all of magnetism and all of light that we cover over the next five days. In other words, it seems like it's going to be an extraordinarily large exam. Okay, that's the downside. So option two, which I don't know is any better or not, and if you don't feel like saying anything, I don't need an answer today. I'm just throwing out the two thoughts that I had. I haven't landed on one. If you guys have a preference, come back on Friday and yell at me and tell me what your preference is. If you have a preference and you don't want to tell everybody else what your preference is, just send me an email. Okay. If you don't mind telling everybody else what your preference is, then just wait till Friday so that I don't have like 50 emails and we can all, you know. Um, but if, you, if you're kind of adverse to saying what your preference is, and you can, you know, congregate and gang up on me too. So you can discuss with your friends. Uh, so the second option is in order to avoid an extremely large exam, I take that last exam and break it into two one for magnetism, one for optics. And then, you know, you open up one, you do it, and you say, okay, there's one exam. And then you can wait, you know, six hours or 10 hours or, you know, five days and open up the other one and do the optics one and then call it quits. So basically taking that large exam, breaking it into two segments, and then I can count each segment as part of the total exams. This takes care of the redistribution, right? I've got 15 points. If we only do one exam that's really large, then I got to figure out what happens to those 15 points in the class. The other way to do it is take that really large exam and break it into two segments and then just give points for each of those segments. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. And I don't know if you, considering I've given about five minutes of thought to this, walking over from Horner Center, I don't expect you guys to you know, give me an answer or anything right now, but mull it over, but those are the two options I see, is do one exam during finals week, figure out how to redistribute the 15 points, either amongst the rest of the exams or amongst the homework or a combination of several factors. So, and I don't know how that would go. Um, the, the downside being it's going to be a really long exam because there's a lot of material to cover. There's like, what, five weeks of material to cover, something like that. Uh, the other option is do two smaller exams during your finals week and distribute the points between those two exams. 
So then it still looks like four exams on the grade book. Um, the downside to that one is, I mean, you're still going to have the same amount of material. It's just that it's two separate exams instead of one big exam. So I, I don't, I don't know. Um, sorry, I just completely got caught off guard. Yes. Do we also have like a cumulative final? No, I mean like that. Like either way, there wouldn't be a cumulative final. No. So okay. like, so I think basically it'd be okay. I'll do one exam on magnetism and another exam on optics, and we'll just forget about the cumulative. I mean, there's still some. You still see some stuff that still comes in, like, oh, you, you can't forget about electric fields in case I do a velocity selector or a Hall probe. That depends on both the magnetic and the electric field, so you can't forget the electric field stuff. Or I could do something like a, a circuit with a resistor and an inductor in it, so you still have to remember Kirchhoff's voltage loss stuff or Kirchhoff's current loss stuff. So you can't necessarily forget that stuff, but I'm not going to explicitly ask you like. A solely electric field question or something like that. Mull it over. Yeah, let me know what you guys think. If you feel comfortable telling me in class, otherwise just email me. And if you want to, I guess if you want to bomb me with emails, you can do that too. So. What are you thinking that it would like come out? I just do the same thing. Exams start on Wednesday, so I just open it up on Wednesday and close it off like the following Wednesday. I think when it's like the 21st through the 28th. Uh, and the only reason I would close it off Wednesday night on the 28th would simply be because I think I'm supposed to have it graded and the final grades in like on Friday. So like if I, I can't, I can't really go past that 28th date because that would give me like a day to get them graded and get grades finalized before the spring term starts. So it's a really quick, like I've already decided in my astronomy class, they're just going to get multiple choice the whole way through because I just don't have time to grade three exams starting on the 28th. Right. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And just do the same thing. Like you open up the exam, you get three hours or something, and then, then it'll close on you. And yes, I do that for if we, if we decide to go for like the, the two separate smaller exams, I just do three hour chunks for both of them. So you could like open up one on Wednesday and do it, and then, you know, oh, okay, let me look over the other stuff. and. Oh, I've got other stuff I got to take care of. Um, that might actually make it a little easier for me too. So I won't mind doing like the magnet one next week or the week, and then doing the light one actually. Yeah, I could try to do something like that too. If you wanted to go like two smaller exam routes, then yeah, I guess I could try to open it up as soon as possible. Um, yeah, I could do that. No, I feel like small chunks of recollection. I, I, I like the idea of smaller chunks as well, but I didn't know how you feel about, okay, now I got to do two of these things instead of one. That's, yeah. Wait, sorry, I'm confused though. Like, what are option one? Option one is one big exam during finals week. Option two is two smaller exams, um, one of which could open earlier than finals week if, if you want. That's not a problem. It sounds like Two smaller exams, one of which that could open as early as next week and close at the end of finals week. Yeah, so the magnetism one I could have ready and open in a couple of days. I just got caught off guard. The mag well, I could just set it so that they both close on the 28th. Okay, so we could, if we did the two smaller ones, we could make them either like both during finals week or one round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the magnetism one, since we're through that material and you've completed the homeworks on that, I could have it ready and I, I could try to have it ready by Friday and open it up by next week and just not set the close date until the 28th. Uh, so then you say, well, I can't do it during dead week, but then it would still be open during the entirety of finals week for you as well. And if you guys get that one done earlier, then I can get it graded and update your grades faster, that kind of thing. Okay. I just don't want to. I just didn't, I don't like idea. If you guys say yeah, that's fine. Come come back. We'll we'll make a decision on Friday. But I'll start working on getting something together. So, like I said, I thought that I had eight days, not five. So, yeah, yeah. Me too. I don't I don't know. I was like, oh yeah, I'd say April. We've got like I was thinking April. For some reason, I was thinking April twenty eighth, and so I was like, okay, so I got until the twenty first. Okay, so I got two two full weeks or something. I don't know what I was thinking. It's just like when I actually looked at a calendar, like April 28th seems far away, and then you realize, oh no, it's not. Something about this Wednesday start, and 
you know, next Friday we don't have class, which seems goofy, but then the following Monday we do. I'm like, I don't know what's going on anymore. Can you guys leave on a Thursday or a Friday now? Right? That's right. Yeah, the last day of exams is on a Tuesday, but the spring term, they, I think they moved up the day one day. So now spring term ends on a Thursday so that you can move out on Friday so that you're out by the time graduation occurs on Saturday. I'm like, I don't know what's going on anymore. We should all just go on vacation to Germany. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Mich auch. Me also. I couldn't even remember her. I couldn't remember gracias this weekend. But somebody said something to me and I was like, gracias. It's like, that's not right. Quite, yeah, like somehow I, I went into Italian. I couldn't come up with gracias. Just kept coming out with grazie, grazie. Prego, prego. It's always important to know these words. Please and thank you. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's okay. Yeah. These front ones are just really clear. Take one. Do you have the light one? Uh, well, no. Right now you have the E&M waves on Monday, right? Yeah, and then um. I think there might be a geometric optics one after that. So I think two total. Do we get rid of the you know, See how you look. Okay. Okay, so then it's just geometric optics. Okay, just one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Let's get this out of the way. Okay, what else we got? I don't even have my PowerPoint up. This is weird. Boom. Sharing screen. Okay. Rock and roll. Uh, I left you here last time. We were working on the uh, the law of refraction, not reflection. Reflection, but refraction. Uh, and we were, we were basically playing along with this. We're, we're using the idea of Fermat's principle to argue that when light hits an interface, when light hits a transition between two materials, that the um, path of light will change. This is based on the idea that uh, light traveling from one location, excuse me, from, from say the source, to the receiver does not follow the line of shortest distance, but rather the line of shortest time. Now we could go through, if you really, I, I, truth be told, I would, have to come, I would have to go back and think about it a little bit. I, it's a geometric argument of some sort, okay? You could take this distance, you know, you could use this angle and that distance and get some triangles and sines and cosines and blah, 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 blah. You could figure out a time that it would take to travel this distance and the time that it would take to travel this distance. And then you just simply have to minimize it. So I say, oh, it's a geometric derivation, but right at the end there, when you have to find an extreme value, a minimum or a maximum, those of you that have had the appropriate math will know that as a, let's say, anybody that hasn't been in calculus, turn off your ears for a second. For those of you that have had calculus, you take a derivative and set it equal to zero. That's how you find the extreme values. Okay, okay turn back on your ears. So, so most of this derivation is, is geometric in nature, but the very last step is uh, requires a step of calculus. You could just say guess and check or throw it into an Excel spreadsheet and figure it out numerically. The fastest way is to take a derivative. So that's, that's essentially where Snell's Law comes from. Now, if you get really jazzed, come upstairs to the office and you'll watch me struggle through it, but we'll, we'll figure it out. I, I've got the idea of how to do it. I just have to shut down and done it on paper. And uh, we have this mysterious end value. Now, unfortunately, again, you can yell at Gray. Don't kill the messenger. But unfortunately, we've already seen lowercase head somewhere else. 
when we were talking about inductors, right? Lowercase n when we were referring to inductors was the turn density. How many, how many coils per unit length? Unfortunately, n is also used for the index of refraction of a material. 26 letters. Yeah. Life goes on. So unfortunately, again, the context of the problem will have to tell you what n refers to. I don't, know, I don't know if you've run into this in like biology or chemistry as much as physics, like this overloading of letters. You know, some of them are reserved. You're like, you'll never see M for anything else but mass. But things like N or L or, you know, they free for all. Uh, N is the, the index of refraction is the ratio of the speed of light to the speed in the material. Okay. So N is really trying to convey something about how quickly light travels through a material. Um, in most practical purposes, you will have N is greater than one. There are some very wonky, not to be seen in this class situations where you can end up with a index of refraction slightly less than one. Uh, and it comes into play when you're dealing with things like X-rays and, and gamma rays and some very high energy radiation. Do not worry about that. That is outside the scope of this course. But if you ever get jazzed about it, there are there's pretty much an exception to every rule, right? I say, hey, n is always greater than one, and then you'll find some case 15 years down the road where it's not. Right, so we'll, we'll deal with spherical cows in space. 99.9% .9 of the time, n is greater than one. And then you get this wonky situation where it's not. Okay. So. I think this is where we left off. Yeah. Can you say again what the speed is? Uh, the speed of light in the material. Okay, so uh, yeah, speed, light. Okay, this is really speed and material. I should have a Keanu Reeves picture up. So there is, um, I don't want to say a competition, but you know, scientists are a competitive bunch. And uh, I believe that one, one material scientist, um, there is one kind of effort to see how slow you can actually get light to travel in material. Uh, so a lot of, there's, uh, there's a, you know, some material science uh, research groups are working on finding materials where V is uh, particularly um, small. So I think they've got it down to a couple, I have to double check, but I think there's at least one material that you can use a high speed camera and literally see the wavefront traveling through the material. So it's it's slow enough that you can actually record it on a camera, which I, I, I don't remember what the index of refraction is, but you know, it's something like a hundred or something like that. So that it slows down light sufficiently that you could actually film it and watch it in slow motion if you want to. Yeah, I mean, a high speed camera is still like a thousand frames a second or you know a couple thousand frames a second, but it's kind of impressive that you can actually see it at all. Bear in mind, C, the speed of light, is fast enough. It's 186,000 miles a second. Right? If you, if you're like, that's seven times around the circumference of the globe every second. Which also gives you an idea why things like fiber optics are so in right now. Right? No? I mean, how do fiber optics work? Oh, I'll have to, actually, it's based on this idea, too. I should, I should all have to do that. When you're dealing with the fiber optic cable, you're not sending an electrical signal. You're sending a light pulse. So if you have, if you have, you know, telephone lines, that's working on electric signal, right? There is a current that is sent through the copper wire from the telephone station to your phone. Or even cable internet. That is, you, you pull the cable cord out, there is a copper wire in there, so it is a current, an electrical signal traveling through that wire that gets delivered to your computer to, you know, let you connect to the internet. Okay. Fiber optics, it is no longer an electrical signal, it is actually pulses of light 
that are being sent down the, the wire. So it's a clear glass tube. Pulses of light that get sent down the clear glass tube that actually convey the information. So the upshot there is that it's a lot faster. You can now travel at almost the speed of light to send the information. So that's why that's why something like if you're, if you're familiar, MetroNet is the local one here on in, in town. MetroNet lays fiber optic cable. They don't send electrical signals, they send light pulses, which are particularly fast. Anyway, uh, yeah, we'll have to, okay, remind me if we don't talk about, we should talk about total internal reflection to be continued. Oh, this, actually, yeah. You ever wonder how they get a light down in somebody's stomach? Right, I mean, like you do the, the I, I have no idea what the procedure is, but like you want to check to see if somebody has an ulcer and so you stick a camera down their, their esophagus, right? Of course, but the problem is, is that, well, first of all, the camera, right, it's dark down there, so I've heard, you need a light. You ever wonder how they get the light down there? It's, it's a fiber optic. Yeah, it's not like they swallow a flashlight, turn it off, that'd be kind of cool, right? Like, here, swallow this LED. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kids do it all the time. Why can't I? No, no, no. So, like, even or or the video feed for that matter. Okay, what they do is they take a flexible. Essentially, it's a glass. It's probably a plastic, just because glass would be dangerous. But it's a flexible tube that they can insert down. They shine a light bulb on one side. That light travels down the tube into your stomach and comes out on the other end. So again, it's a fiber optic cable. And the video feed works the same way. That's how you can, you know, like, we'll, we'll say that's how you check for ulcers. I mean, I'm sure that you can do it going on the other end as well. Right? Is that right? I, I assume. I don't know what I mean. I, it's not a, I guess that's a colonoscopy, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So that's how you can get light into the little, you just take a flexible tube, run it down and then shine light in on one side. Light will travel down the tube into the stomach and then it'll illuminate what's down there. Okay, so remind me, I will have to talk about total internal reflection. So let's get done with this feed first and then we'll, we'll get back to that. Okay, so, uh, so here's a question. Uh, let's say, and you probably all experienced this. Let's say you're outside on a nice sunny day and you have before you a nice calm lake. Okay. Now, uh, the index of refraction for air, I put approximately one. It's something like 1.000029 or something like that. I mean, it's very close. The speed of light in air is very close to the speed of light in vacuum. For all practical purposes, just say that to the same. That's fine. But in water, you'll notice that uh, the speed or index of refraction is about 1.2. In other words, uh, in water, light travels about four fifths the speed of light, about 80% of what the vacuum rate is. So that's that's where the 1.2 comes from. So the question, uh, which angle is bigger, the angle in air or the angle in the water? Go ahead, talk to you there, get an idea. Which angle is larger? And, and notice I've drawn in the normal for you. Okay. So which angle is larger? Is it the angle that's in air or is it the angle that's in water? Go ahead, talk to your neighbor, get an idea, go. Okay. Yeah, get an idea.
say it is that hey light travels faster in air it's going to want to spend a longer time greater distance in air as opposed to water you could go that way the other way that we could do it is uh thinking about snell's law and sorry i should have written it down uh you have m1 sine of theta one equals n2 material two sine of theta two so the angle in material two so if We'll put it this way. If the index of refraction of material one is less than material two, right? If the index of refraction in one material is less than the index of refraction in the other material, how would the signs compare? If N1 is less than N2, then sine, we'll put sine of theta one, how does that compare to the sine of theta two? Which one of these has to be larger? Sine of theta, right? If n one is small, that means sine of theta one has to be larger. Okay. Now we have to think about, this is always good, sine of zero. Zero, zero. sine of 90, one. So as the angle goes up, as sine goes up, the angle must go up, right? You start at sine starts at zero. It's at starts goes from zero to one. That means as the angle increases, sine increases. Right? So by saying sine of theta one must be greater than sine of theta two, that implies that theta one is greater than theta two. Theta one is greater than theta two. Math term, monotonic. So the, the, the fancy, if you ever want to impress your friends, the fancy term is sine monotonically increases. What it means is that as the angle increases, sine increases. It's not linear though, right? It's not a linear increase. It's, it, so it's, you can't say, it's not a straight line, it's some funky curve. Incidentally, uh, notice that we will limit our discussion from sine of, we'll limit our discussion from zero degrees to 90 degrees. And that comes from the fact that, hey, if I'm dealing with the normal, you can't get farther away than 90 degrees. And once you go 90 degrees away, now you're, you, you, right, like, yeah. So our, 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 our discussion will be limited between zero and 90 degrees. Okay, so the angle in the air is larger than the angle in the water. You've probably all experienced this. It's really hard for our brain to remember this. I don't know if you've experienced this or not. If the angle in the air is greater than the angle in the water, where will the fish appear to be? This is an actuality. The fish is located here. Where will your brain think the fish is located? Closer to you or further away from you? I'm just curious. When you look into the water, just like, I mean, I'm sure you've all done this, like looking at a stone or a fish in the water or something, you know, thinking of yourself next to a really calm lake, and you look into the water to see an object. Are you thinking about Snell's law? Are you thinking about the fact that the index of refraction comes into play and changes the angle as the water, as the light travels from the water to your eye? Survey says, no, right? What you're thinking is, I see the fish right there. Right, you point directly at the fish. In other words, you point, there we go, directly at the fish. You don't point, 
You're not, you're not thinking about Snell's law. You just point along the line of sight. Right? The fish is right here. But because of the refraction of light at the interface, the fish appears to be located further away from you than it actually is. You say, oh, look, the fish is there. You're, you're pointing along the line of sight. In reality, you should point slightly closer to you. Or a different way to say it. This seems weird. I see the fish there, therefore it's located there. Right? What you see is not where it's physically located. It's actually slightly closer. Which is weird. Oh, I'm going to erase this writing here because I believe I have a couple pictures. I'm going to just get rid of Snell's Law here. I know one of the pictures, you, you've probably noticed this. Try this. Go, go to the CC, fill up a glass of water, take a pencil and do this. But you've probably done something like this. Or you've probably seen something like this. A pole placed into the water, and you notice that the pole is right here. Pole, 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 and then here's where it comes in and goes out of the water. Guess what? The pole's not bent. It's a straight, it's a straight pole placed into the water. Right? It seems weird. Like the pole is actually not bent. It's a straight pole. What's making it seem like it's bent is the fact that that light changes directions when it comes out of the water. It's really hard for our brains to kind of get used to this. I make the mistake too. Don't ask me. I'll point to the fishes right there. I'll fall for it too. I know I've, I've waxed and waned over, over America's sweetheart, otherwise known as You know, the best actor ever. Okay, maybe not the best ever. One of the best. My person. I'm not very starstruck by people. I gotta admit this. But I gotta admit, if if Mr. Tom Hanks came walking into this room, I might just have to ask for a picture. America's sweetheart, isn't he? Okay, we can all agree that Angels and Demons wasn't his best choice. Okay, we all get. Yeah, we get that. Like, Catch Me If You Can, Apollo 13, Big. You know, Road to Perdition, Forrest Gump. You no? Know, you weren't a fan of Road to Perdition? No, but Gump. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll just have nobody's perfect. That's okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, the one that I'm thinking about is I, I love, I, it's been years since I've actually watched it, but uh, anybody see Castaway? Yeah, I mean, like, okay, you spend like two, an hour and a half watching a movie where nobody speaks. Okay. Now, you'll have to remind me, I'll, I'll, I'll pull up the recollection. I don't know if you if you remember the scene or not, but I distinctly remember, I've seen it like, like I said, it's been about a decade since I've seen it, but I still remember the scene. Do you remember the scene where he's spearfishing? So he just crashed, if you've never seen Castaway, Tom Hanks, he's a pilot, he crashes on an island, right? a deserted island. And so he's got to figure out how to survive. And uh, one of the things he does is, okay, I need food. And so he starts trying to spear fish. And uh, I remember it's a transition scene. So he, like, he's struggling and, you know, like he's getting to witness all of his struggles. And one of the struggles is catching food. He's running through the water, stabbing at the fish that he sees. Guess what? If you're not thinking about this, if you're not thinking about this refraction, now, of course, spear fisher, spear, people that spear fish, they already take this into account. They've gotten used to it, right? And I love that scene in Castaway because it shows Tom Hanks trying to spear at fish and he continually misses. Why? Refraction. If you throw the spear where you see the fish, guess what? You're aiming too far away. Right? If you aim to where you see the fish located, you're not going to hit the fish. It's actually slightly closer to you. So I remember the scene in Castaway where he's running around trying to spear fish and he's getting nothing. Aside from the fact that he's like running through the water like a big buffoon and making a lot of noise. But the other issue is, is that if you throw the spear where you see the fish, you're going to miss. It's actually closer to you. So the thing I remember about that scene is, yeah, it shows him running through trying to spear fish. And then it does a scene cut. And the next scene, 
It's him standing on a rock, throwing the spear, and it hits the fish, and, and he gets food. All right, so it, it, was, it was the idea that the trial and error, he spent so much time trial and erroring that he finally figured out how to actually spear fish. So you get this impression of a lot of time has gone on before you even see that Tom Hanks is all grizzly and tan and really thin and all that kind of stuff. Like that scene about, hey, he's now successfully spear fishing. I, I always like that scene. Like, you know, exposition stink. When you can do something like that where you can convey very quickly that a lot of time has passed without saying anything, that's that's real. Uh, I'm watching Angels and Demons right now that have Stern and they're explaining the anti-matter. Huh? Wait, what? Show, don't tell. Yeah, show, don't tell. Right? So I, was like, yeah, I was watching Dishes last night. I thought about a mindless movie. I was like, oh, Angels and Demons. That's a mindless movie. And they're sitting there explaining antimatter to me for like five minutes. I'm like, first of all, I'm a physicist. I have an idea about antimatter. I'm not the greatest physicist. Let's try this. But I, I know what antimatter is, and I know that you're just feeding me a load of garbage. You spent five minutes doing it just so that you could go through the rest of the movie. Yeah, show no time. <laughs> of course, this is also, a, you know, you could use this. You probably also had said, said this. Um, you ever you ever go to an aquarium or like have a fish tank at home? I mean, this is a really fancy way of getting two, two fish for the prices, price of one. Right? Because what happens? You can stand near the edge of a tank. Go home if you have like a 10 gallon tank, position yourself near the edge. Now you, you might have to go like up, down, or left, right, or something, but get, get near an edge. Some place where there's two faces of the fish tank. And you get two fish instead of one. Right? Yeah. If you're watching the light will flash the grass at a lesser angle, as it appears further away than it actually is for closer. It appears further. Uh, it, it appears further away because your eye follows the line of sight using the larger angle. So your your natural inclination is to just think of a straight line of sight to the object. So it appears to be further away when it's truly slightly closer. Yeah. Now, I, I like the idea. We could flip it. Let's say that you're in water looking at an object in air. Okay. So if you're underwater trying to look at, if you're the fish underwater trying to look at Tom Hanks, you will think that Tom Hanks is actually closer than, than he actually is. So it works the opposite way as well. If you're in the air looking in the water, the fish appears further away. If you're the fish looking up in the air, the person appears to be closer. Oh. oh, sorry. Objects appear closer than they actually. Uh, yeah, like objects appear closer than they actually are. Movie. Yeah, yeah, it's the car rear view mirror. There's a real. I think they might have done it in cars actually. Now that I think about it. I don't know. There's there's a scene in Jurassic Park where the Tyrannosaurus Rex is chasing the Jeep, and I love that. Sorry, I'm 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 in movies today, right? You see, they look in the rear view mirror and it says objects are closer than they appear, and it's like the T Rex is like, you're like, well, crap, how much closer could this thing get? <laughs> right? Like, I already see the teeth and the mouth coming at me. Like, love that scene. Yeah. So for the fish, the object will appear closer than it actually is. Yeah. So you have to be careful. Yeah, the mirror, the car, the rear view mirror will get at that, but the, the that side mirror is bowed ever so slightly. It's not a flat mirror, and so and they bow it so to give you a little bit larger field of view. But the the downside to that is that it's demagnified a little bit. It looks smaller than it actually is, which means it's actually closer than it appears. Again, your brain tends to use the relative size of an object to gauge distances. So when you look in the mirror and say, oh, the car looks small. It must be far away. That's why they printed on there. No, it's closer than it looks. Yeah. So you could do this at the corner of a fish tank, for example. You could think of, for example, well, if you're near the corner, the top surface, the fish appears to be further away. 
But if you're looking down through the side surface, you get a second refraction. And so then instead of it looking like a single fish in the fish tank, you actually get two. Right? That'll appear to be one located there, they'll appear to be one located there. It's because you're getting the refraction of a single fish off of two different surfaces. And if you can position yourself ever so, it, it depends on the tank and how far away the fish is and all that kind of stuff. But every once in a while, if you can get yourself positioned in the right spot, you can actually get three. You get one refraction from the top, you get one from the front face, and you can get one from the side face and actually see the fish three different times. All right, have you ever played around with this? I think Walmart still has fish, right? Do they still have fish? I don't know. Go to a, go to go to PetSmart. Surely PetSmart has fish. Just try this out. You get two for the price of one. No, I'm not going to buy two clownfish. You just need to stand at the right location, man. Right. That's very funny. It's like clownfish. Okay. Well, I guess we've already played this song and dance, but uh, we did this for mirrors. Why don't we think about it for refraction as well? Uh, light is incident on the prism stone. Uh, prism, piece of glass usually. Um, uh, usually, like the prisms, I mean, your spectrometers would have prisms in it, for example. Okay. Uh, just basically a very, uh, very clean piece of glass. And clean, not only do I mean the surfaces, but I mean uh, very, um, uh, 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 not very many impurities inside the crystal. There we go. So, uh, usually prisms have some index of refraction between two and four, depending on what it's made out of. So if it's like boron, uh, so what is it, silicon boride, or if it's quartz, um, it'll have slightly different index of refractions. So, uh, so question for you. Um, Light enters this prism. I've drawn an array of lights. I've given you the normal. First question, uh, which direction will be the deflection of the beam? In which way will the beam be deflected? At this uh, this front interface. Shout out of curiosity. Oh, you can you can talk to your neighbor too if you really need to. Yeah. Which which direction will the beam be deflected? Upwards, downwards, no, no deflection in the hospital return. I'm getting into the lens thing now. It's going to light itself. Moving into a higher index material, should the angle get larger or should it get smaller? That's really the question. Or some people will say, should it bend towards the normal or should it bend away from the normal? You might hear that terminology as well. Should that beam of light get closer to the normal? In other words, a smaller angle or should it bend away from the normal, a larger angle? Toward when you enter the higher index material, the angle's got to get smaller. Yeah. So again, it's the it's Snell's law. And sorry, I guess I should keep it written up here. Oh, where'd it go? There it is. Yeah. So you have and oh wow. That's some muscle memory right there. N1 sine of theta 1 equals N2 sine of theta 2. So if your index of refraction goes up, say here's air, 
your index of refraction goes up, your angle must go down. So moving from a low index to a high index material, your ray of light bends towards the normal. Smaller angle, something like this. How about the back face? Let's assume for a second that this triangle is of sufficient size, this prism is of sufficient size, that when it strikes the back, it naturally strikes that flat back face. What's it going to do then? It goes away from the normal. In fact, I think I draw a normal in. Let's put a normal in. Now notice I've changed the direction of the normal, right? Normal is always perpendicular to the face. So originally when I was entering, we have it like this. Now, since I have a flat back face, I'll draw in my new normal. And now I've got to have, I've got a lower index of refraction. It should be a larger angle. So it should bend down. Yeah, even more down. You get two for the you get two refractions. You get one off the front face and you get one off the back face. And then you keep going. Keep going like. Questions? Yay, yay. So I, I put this in here because I was thinking uh, if we were doing mirrors, you remember when we were doing these mirrors, uh, we had to position our triangle something like this. Sorry, those are junky triangles. But we said, hey, you know, light comes in, it reflects off the front face of the mirror and gets deflected downwards. Light comes in on this bottom one that reflects off the bottom mirror and goes upwards. We said if those are mirrored surfaces, we use the law of reflection to tell us how we have to have these things oriented to get the beams across. You know, so if I do the same situation with prisms and the law of refraction, you notice that I have to have those triangles oriented the other way. In other words, instead of having this set up like I have drawn, I would have to have something like this, where the triangle is like this, or maybe the two triangles, if, 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 I, if you will. That's a really junky triangle, sorry. And you could think of a beam of light coming in on the top. It refracts a couple of times and gets directed downwards. You could think of a beam of light coming in on the bottom. It refracts a couple of times and gets directed upwards, and so then you end up with your focus the spot where both of the beams cross behind the lens, if you will. You got to go through the lens and the focus is on the other side. Yeah, yeah. So what sort of lens do you need in order to focus the light? You want to focus light and you want to use refraction to do the focusing. Should you be using a concave lens or a convex lens? Convex, you want to bow outwards. Right, a concave mirror will focus the light. A convex lens will also focus it. Thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm off. Close your eyes. There. Okay, we're back. All right. So again, you could think of the triangles. You could think of taking these small pieces, these triangles, to focus the light. Incidentally, I, I threw the rest of this in here, but uh, when you're looking at a, a lens, it's really the shape of the surface that matters. And the rest of the material isn't really doing anything. The only thing the rest of the material is doing, this, this bulk of this material in here, uh, the reason it's there is because it's easier to make a lens with material like that. 
right? It's easier to make a lens that's solid rather than just doing a bunch of different triangles and pasting them together. In terms of the operation of the lens, all of this material doesn't do anything. It's there for structural support or for manufacturing ease, but in terms of doing actual focusing of the light, that, that material plays no role. So yes, you could do just the exact, you could get the exact same result if that material were absent. It would just be wicked expensive to manufacture. It'd be a lot harder to manufacture. And oh, by the way, it'd probably be brittle because you don't have the underlying structure holding everything in place. So a convex lens has the appropriate shape that will focus all those beams. Whereas if you take those triangles and flip them around, okay, there we go. If you take all of these triangles and you happen to order them in the opposite direction, then as they go through, you'll end up spreading them out further. And so if I have a convex lens, the rays of light will be focused down. If I have a concave lens, they'll end up spreading out on the other side. Oh, so I have a picture. Yeah, there we go. Both lenses will have a focus. It's just that for a concave lens, the focus is not on the side where the rays are. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what this means, but this essentially is the point in space from which the rays appear to originate. So if I forget about these incoming beams, but only think about the outgoing ones, this focus is the location and space from which they would appear to have originated from if the lens were not present. To be continued. But... Questions so far? I just realized one of the things that's not skipped, but I should, should make sure to double back on it. Okay. Let's get into ray diagrams. So, so now we kind of have a sense of what's going on for mirrors. We have a sense of what's going on for lenses. Now let's let's put this stuff to good use. Let's let's do some qualitative assessment of stuff. Uh, and it's called ray diagrams. Uh, the first thing, and I don't remember if I had it on this list or not. So the first thing I'll start off with. We are going to assume that we start with coherent light. Uh, what that means when you hear the term coherent light, um, single wavelength, and single color, if you will. It turns out the index of refraction that I've given you, that technically depends on what color of light you're using. The index of refraction varies ever so slightly for red light as compared to yellow light, as compared to purple light, et cetera, et cetera. For each wavelength, it's slightly different. You know this because if you take white light and run it through a prism, each wavelength of light experiences a slightly different refraction. And so when you take white light, you put it through a prism, and you look at it on the other side, what do you see? A rainbow. What you're seeing is that the index of refraction is different for each wavelength of light. Each color gets refracted ever so slightly differently. That's why you get the rainbow at the end of the day. We are going to ignore that completely. We will just say we're dealing with a single wavelength of light. You do not, the, the index of refraction is this constant value. And so we're going to ignore the fact, if you're really interested, if you've heard of it, it's called the dispersion relation. The, very, the how the index of refraction varies according to wavelength. I don't care about that. And in fact, yes, this is an unavoidable thing. Okay. How, for example, cameras get around this or microscopes. 
Because if, sorry, if each individual wavelength gets focused to a different location, that means that if you're trying to take a picture, for example, the focusing for the red light will be at a different location than the blue light, than the green light, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that would hold for like your microscopes or your cameras or you know anything else. How, how we get around that is we put a nice layer of oil on the lens. So that oil basically helps try to minimize that dispersion. And uh, any of you play around with microscopes? You've played around with microscopes, I assume. Yeah. One of the things that you have to do is clean the objective every once in a while, right? Oh shoot, I ran my objective into the sample. I better pull it out and clean the objective. One of the things that you should never do. Not up there. Windex. Don't use Windex on an objective. Right? You say, why not? Windex is a glass cleaner. I say, oh yes, for example, but the glass on the objective has a nice oil-based coating on it to help minimize the dispersion of wavelengths of light. Windex will remove that coating. No? Have you guys ever? I don't know. Have you guys gone through like microscope treatment? Like what, what you should do, what you shouldn't do? Basically, I think it's any ammonium-based cleaner will remove that. Same thing with cameras. If you have like a nice total telephoto lens and you get some dirt on it and you want to clean it, don't do Windex. Don't use a glass cleaner. A glass cleaner will remove the oil coating and it'll wreck your lens. So. So always be careful about that. When you want to clean something, just make sure, hey, is there an oil coating on it? So binoculars, if you have a pair of binoculars, just turn it up. You can tell if there's an oil coating. If you look at the reflection of light off of the surface, if it looks greenish or if it looks purplish, there's a coating on it. Okay? It's not reflecting white light. It's reflecting only certain colors. There's a coating on it. Okay? So just be careful. No, you, binoculars or tele, any of this? You guys noticed this before? No, okay, come upstairs, I'll show you a pair of binoculars and you can see it. Yeah. Okay, so, okay. So uh, the first thing is uh, ray diagrams. I've already mentioned this, but uh, we, will, we will work off of the optical axis. What that essentially means is the center of the mirror or the center of the lens. And we're going to go ahead and just assume that the lens is symmetric. So the optical axis is the symmetry axis for the uh, lens and or mirror. Uh, next thing, uh, we have a couple of rules for drawing ray diagrams. Uh, so the first one is light that comes in parallel to the optical axis. If you have, you have the optical axis, the symmetry axis of your, your lens or mirror, any light ray that comes in parallel to the optical axis, when it strikes the mirror or the lens, it will be directed to the focus. So parallel light, light parallel in, goes through the focus. The second idea is that a ray of light that passes through the focus will be directed parallel to the optical axis. This, um, this is how you say, well, how do lens makers know the right shape? How do lens makers know that this shape will do this? These are kind of the rules. I will design a lens and I will grind a lens such that light parallel to the optical axis goes through the focus. Light that goes through the focus comes out parallel to the optical axis. And when we do these ray diagrams, essentially we'll draw three rays. One ray will be parallel to the optical axis going through the focus. A second ray will go through the focus and come out parallel to the optical axis. And the third ray, depends on whether you're dealing with a mirror or if you're dealing with a lens. So these two will be the same regardless of the focusing element. 
The third one's the one that depends that will vary. In fact, I guess I could tell you. I don't remember if I put it as a bullet point, so I'll tell you verbally first. Then we'll find out if I wrote it down or not. Okay. If it's a mirror. And so for mirrors, the ray that strikes the surface perpendicular comes directly back. Right. Yeah. So the ray that goes perpendicular to the mirror surface goes directly back. I'm always fearful that I'm going to forget something. Say, well, why don't you have it on your notes? I for, I for, I'm fearful that I forgot to put it on my notes. So then I'll find out that I didn't put it on my notes, and then I'll have to go back and correct it again. For a lens. So for a mirror, if it is perpendicular to the surface, it gets directed back. For a lens, the ray of light that goes exactly at the center of the lens passes through undeflected. So if you can if you can shoot a ray of light right through the exact center of the lens, it'll come out the other side undeflected. It'll be like a straight line path. Let's see. Did I put okay? So that, those are the so these two we'll use all the time. These two we'll use all the time, and then the third one just depends if we're dealing with a mirror or we're dealing with a dealing dealing with a lens. Uh, I was going to give you an equation, but I think I'm going to let's stop there, and I'll, I'll give you a sense of what's going on. So a ray diagram. Uh, usually, now these do not have to be. We don't need artistic rendering. Okay. Uh, I'm a physicist, I'm not an artist, so you know, stick figures are good enough. So here's how, do you want to do a mirror or do you want to do a lens? Huh? Oh, what at that time? Is it do a mirror first? Okay, you want a concave or a convex mirror? You have a lot of options here. Concave, okay. So let's do a concave mirror. And hopefully I get this right, so we'll find out. So here's a concave mirror, and I will draw an optical axis. In other words, that line should go exactly through the, sym the symmetry axis of the mirror. So even though I draw in that concave, that's just to get the profile, you can think of this as a round mirror. So it's a concave round mirror, side view. And this will be what I call the optical axis. So the optical axis, and you don't need to label these, I'm just giving it to you for, for sake of um, clarity. Okay, uh, let's see here. Right now, I don't, uh, let's go ahead, uh, I'll put a focus right here. Sorry, that's a terrible color. It looks exactly the same. Let me see if I can get a better color. I'm just gonna leave a little X where the focus is. That's not orange. Question. So I'll put the focus right here. And hopefully I don't mess this up. Put it right there. So I'm just using that X to represent the focus right now. I don't know. Uh, question. Uh, do you want to put your object, the thing that is going to be reflected, do you want to put it closer to the mirror than the focus or further away? There's no right answer. I just, I'm just curious. Do you want to put your, so we want to look at the reflection of the object in a mirror. The question I have is where do we want to put the object? Do we want to put the object closer to the mirror than the focus or, or, or further away from the mirror than the focus? And we'll do the other, we'll do the other situation later. Further away. Okay. I hope this works. So, Optical axis, this is the focus of the mirror. And okay, further away. Here's my object. Yes. Very artistic. Okay. 
The only reason I put the arrow head on, usually, I mean, most of the time you'll just see your object as being an arrow. The reason for that is that this is the object. When I get the image, when I get the place where all of the light beams converge, okay, I need to be able to tell if the object is upright or upside down. That's why we put the arrow head on. Okay. So just to give us an idea, okay, is the object going to be upright after the reflection or is it going to be upside down after the reflection? Now we have a couple of beams. Oh man, I hope I did this right. Oh, we'll find out. I don't remember. Okay, so we have a couple of beams. We generally a ray diagram will will draw three rays, three three pieces, three light beams rays. So like, how do you define a ray? Well, it's a beam of light. Well, it's a beam. Well, it's a ray of light. I feel like singing Madonna right now. Ray of light. Not a fan. Okay. okay. Number one, let's take a ray of light going from the top of our object parallel to the optical axis. So I've got the optical axis in there. I've got my object, just this arrow. And the first thing that we'll do is let's take one ray of light. I think I'll use aqua here, or uh, let's use a, a, a green. Okay. I will take a ray of light. I will travel parallel to the optical axis, I will strike the mirror, and because it's a reflection, right, it doesn't pass through the mirror, it's a reflection. And when it reflects off, the, when the light beam is parallel to the optical axis and it reflects off the mirror, where does that ray of light go? Through the focus. Okay. So you say, where do, I, where do I direct this beam of light now that struck the mirror? You draw it through the focus. And I have no idea if I can get this even close to being straight. I wish I could. Does anybody know how to put grid lines on this thing? I, I don't. You can. So it goes through the focus. Something like that. I've just done that in brief. Sometimes it helps having multiple colors as well. If, 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 you, if you happen to have pens on you, Sometimes I find it helpful to have multiple colors available. So that's number one. The second one is, hey, the beam of light that goes through the focus should strike the mirror and come out parallel to the optical axis. Okay. So the second one is, let's run it through the focus. Let's see if I can get the focus. There we are. And let me see if I can get this there. Okay. And I got to find this. Right there. Something like this. So if I go top of my object through the focus, I hit the mirror and I come out parallel to the optical axis. Something like that. And already you have a sense of where the lines are converging, where those two rays intersect in space. Okay. Yes, you can say, well, Greg, is that, a, is that, a, let's see here. Let's see. What am I missing here? Oh, I think I've given you something bad. Okay. Generally, that would be enough to say, okay. Two rays, as long as they're drawn correctly, should be sufficient to say where the image is going to be. So you do two rays to make sure you know where it is, and you do the third one to make sure that you haven't screwed anything up. I think I screwed something up. Why have I screwed something up? Because I'm gray, of course. Because the third one I was thinking of is... So for a mirror, I said the third one is it perpendicular to the, oh, there's, okay, there's four. We could do four. So right away you can say, hey, it looks like, just based on these two, drawn correctly, you notice that your image should be right here, where all of your beams of light have focused. They emanate from the top of your object, 